the sound of Athenian thalassocracy was the sound of one of their triremes bearing down on you, the enemy. And what you would have heard first was those oars, those 170 oars hitting the water in unison in this huge whoomph, whoomph, whoomph. And then this gurgle, and that's the water surging along the sides of that 120 foot long wooden hull. On top of this is gonna come the chanting. When finally that noise of the bronze ram scything through the sea surface as it makes its way on its ramming stroke right at your ship. I can't imagine any more scary assemblage of noises in the whole history of human warfare. We get descriptions of how they were used in battle, where a trireme would come up to a merchant ship, would do a tight turn around it, and would catch the trireme that was pursuing it unawares and sink the ship. Usually what you would do is dent the ship, punch a hole in it, and now it's swamping, it's starting to take water, it's disabled. It can no longer fight. The high-tech Greek trireme combined with the effective tactics of a highly skilled crew transforms the warship into a virtual torpedo. This is good because the Persians invade Greece once again. Only this time they arrive with an enormous military force, a huge force the size the world has never seen. The Persians feel if we can't beat them by the manner of fighting, since these hoplite Greek warriors were so hard to defeat, we will defeat them by numbers. We will, we will create an army so vast that it can surround and overcome any opposing force. We will do the same thing at sea. We will create a fleet with our Egyptian subjects, our Phoenician subjects, our Calician subjects, our Greek Ionian subjects. We'll make them all assemble hundreds of ships each, and we will have a fleet of warships that can surround and overcome anything. In 480 BC, the second invasion of Greece is led by King Xerxes, who, with enormous sea and land forces, marches across Asia Minor through Thrace and Macedonia to Thessaly while simultaneously the Persian fleet sails along the coast, following the army. In order to reach the Greek city's states overland, the Persian army must cross the Hellespont, a narrow body of water that poses a geographical barrier between Asia and Europe. To accomplish this, the Persian army builds a three-quarter mile pontoon bridge. It is a daunting and challenging engineering feat, which allows the Persian army to move over land at full force. Once at Thermopylae, the Persian land forces engage Greek hoplite soldiers in battle, where a heroic stand of 300 Spartans slows the Persian advance, but does not stop it. At the same time, at Artemisium, a nearby coast, the allied Greek states hold off the Persian navy for three days. Neither side is victorious. The Greeks then withdraw all their ships to Salamis. A naval victory is now crucial for Greece, and their trireme is just the weapon to do it. The straits between the island of Salamis and the Greek mainland provide an ideal location. Anticipating a great victory, Xerxes sits on a gold throne to watch the battle. Xerxes, however, soon realizes he has been outsmarted. The small waterway is an ideal place to battle for the fast maneuverable Greek triremes, which destroy more than 200 larger, less steerable Persian warships. This decisive Greek victory plays a tremendous role in the future of Athens and its young concept of democracy. The Battle of Salamis is significant because it allows the Athenian democracy to survive. The trireme itself also helps democracy by expanding the number of people participating in the government. Because in an ancient society, citizenship depends on being a person who serves in the military. When you build over a hundred warships, and each warship needs 
170 rowers, and all those rowers are going to be citizens of the Demos, that laboring class of citizens, Thetes was their other name, T-H-E-T-E-S. You have changed the balance of power. Democracy means rule by more people than oligarchy. And so the more people who benefited were the ones who normally were never given a say. And they were given a say at this time because they performed a useful function for the state. They were the engine that drove the trireme. Following the Battle of Salamis, the Athenians liberate other Greek city-states, expand the trireme fleet, and form the Delian League. This is an alliance where each city-state contributes military resources or funds in lieu of forces. More importantly, the Delian League provides the apparatus used by Athens to establish a thalassocracy. Athenian thalassocracy is one of the most extraordinary periods in human history. So important for the changes it brought in our ideas of democratic government, of culture, but also so well-defined as one tiny window in time where a single city-state through thalassocracy, through rule of the seas, is able to make itself one of the richest centers of human endeavor on the face of the earth. With this wealth comes the flowering of Athenian culture. Athenians build their famous structures and Athens becomes the city of learning. Literature, art, philosophy and science significantly flourish, creating what we now call the Golden Age of Greece, where the foundation for Western civilization begins. At the heart of this accomplishment is the Greek trireme, whose influence on history and Greek society is unprecedented. Nobody explains this better than the ancient Greek playwright Aeschylus, who wrote that the fearful Persians heard the Greeks singing their fight song long before they saw a single warship. Forward, sons of the Greeks, liberate the fatherland, liberate your children, your women, the altars of the gods of your fathers and the graves of your forebears. Now is the fight for everything.